Thank you so much for the introduction. And thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about our cyanotype pipeline, which is a high throughput pipeline aimed at tagging and localizing every protein in the proteome of the model cyanobacterium Synecococcus elongatus 7942. I sometimes like to remind myself why cyanobacteria are so interesting and why there is so much value in studying them and their biology, and why actually we might like to understand their proteome in more depth. So we know that cyanobacteria have a vital role in global carbon cycling, and they may perform about a sixth of the world's photosynthesis, depending on which estimate correct you use. They also share some common ancestry with chloroplasts, which are traditionally very difficult to study. So what we learn about cyanobacteria could be really helpful and, and translatable to understanding photosynthesis in some of the world's most important crop plants. Cyanobacteria are also absolutely essential to our ecosystems, and they may well be essential in the future as part of our more sustainable bio-industries that are desperately needed. One thing that's particularly fascinating about cyanobacteria is their carbon dioxide concentrating mechanisms. And there's just a very brief overview of how this works. Bicarbonate, which is the form of inorganic carbon most commonly found in aquatic environments, is actively transported into the cyanobacterial cell. And in specialized micro compartments called carboxysomes, this bicarbonate is converted into carbon dioxide. These carboxysomes are packed full of rubisco, and the high concentration of carbon dioxide here creates the optimal conditions for the enzyme and substrate to meet, which results in the release of a three carbon compound into the cytoplasm. Here it combines with the products of the light dependent reactions of photosynthesis, which in this model cyanobacterium happens in the thylakoid membranes or in these concentric stacks around the outside of the cell body. This takes the process of converting the energy from light and inorganic carbon into biomass well on its way. So given their global importance and the fascinating and important carbon dioxide concentrating mechanisms they contain, we know relatively little about the basic biology of cyanobacteria, especially when we compare them to other model systems such as a mouse or a C. elegans worm or any human cell or any human disease. We haven't explored their proteome in any great depth and there are many, many discoveries that we could make by doing so. So to address this sort of gulf in our knowledge about cyanobacterial cell biology, we've developed the cyanotype pipeline, which is a high throughput pipeline that aims to tag and localize cyanobacterial proteins. So in brief, this pipeline involves cloning plasmids corresponding to each of the protein coding genes in the genome. That's around two and a half thousand genes in Cyanococcus elongatus 7942. We then transform these plasmids into cyanobacteria use a series of selection steps that I'll talk about on the next slide to generate our mutants of interest. And then we use these mutants in super resolution imaging to determine the subcellular localization of proteins and in affinity purification math spectrometry analyses to get a sense of the protein interaction network or the interacting. So for those of you with a particular interest in molecular biology, these slides are for you. So each of our plasmids is designed to integrate a series of tags and markers at the five prime end of the gene of interest by homologous recombination. So upon transformation and selection, we get what we call marked mutants. And these mutants have our gene of interest fused to an M neon green fluorophore and a slag tag. Then we have downstream of that two selectable markers, a positive selectable marker for canamycin resistance, which we use to select successful transformation and integration of this construct, and the COD A gene product, which is a negative selectable marker that we use in the counter selection process, together with a second set of tags downstream. So when we apply a compound 5 neurocytosine, this selects against the expression of the COD A gene product and essentially selects for the second homologous recombination event between our two sets of tags, hence removing the markers and leaving what we call a, a markerless mutant. So this is basically a method to scarlessly introduce tags onto our gene of interest. And we don't have these selectable markers anymore, which means that we can recycle them again if we want to further modify other genes in the organism. So I'll go through each of the steps of the pipeline in a little bit more detail. 
So, so the cloning, we use genomic DNA and a couple of PCR reactions to amplify homology arms corresponding to the five prime end of the gene and the three prime UCR. And then we use a single step golden gate reaction to clone these homology arms into our cloning vectors. And then we validate these vectors by colony PCR and Sanger sequencing. The transformation step is my favorite because it's the most straightforward. We simply incubate the plasmids that we've generated with our cyanobacteria overnight in the dark. The selection steps I've briefly described on the previous slide, but essentially we use increasing concentrations of calamycin to get these homoplasmic marked mutants. So we want to ensure that every copy of the gene of interest in our genome is tagged and there could be eight or so. So that involves a significant amount of selection on canamycin. We then use this counter-selection method that I've described to remove those markers and generate these scarlessly tagged mutants. I'm also working on adding additional steps in this pipeline so that we can use these mutants to get an idea of protein abundance using the fluorescence of the protein that we've tagged as a proxy for its expression level. We've tried a couple of different methods to do this, but the most promising seems to be a flow cytometry based method. And this preliminary data hopefully can illustrate to you that we can see even quite low levels of fluorescence in our mutants. So this red peak here is the neon green fluorescence arising from our wild type cells. And in purple here, this is a line that's expressing such low levels of a fluorophore that it's very difficult to see down the microscope, but we can still see this clear separation by flow cytometry. So we're hoping that this method will give us the means to assess protein abundance and help us prioritize ideal lines for use in imaging and proteomic studies. So the imaging, we're using a super resolution approach using the Zeiss and Lyra Sevithness sim combined with a lattice sim super resolution method. And I'll show you some images in the later part of this talk. We're also collaborating with a research group in London who are in the early stage of developing a deep learning based approach using artificial intelligence to be able to classify these images in a less biased way than I'm currently doing it by eye. Thanks to the arrival of a relative new technician in our lab, Matt, we've started to optimize the affinity purification mass spectrometry part of this protocol. So he sent me a, a nice slide, which I'll show. This is the least high throughput step in the process because everything else can be optimized to a 96 well format, but the protocol involves growing around 50 milliliters of cyanobacterial culture, which is the biggest barrier to this being a more high throughput step. We then pellet the cells and lyse them with glass beads. And then we load this lysate onto a different kind of bead that's hybridized to an m neon green nanobody. So the anti neon green nanobody binds to our protein that we've tagged and carries with it any bound proteins from the lysate. We can then analyze these bound proteins using a mass spectrometry based approach, quite a rapid data independent position method. And we're starting to build a protein interactome using these data. So having spent some time optimizing these steps, we're now in a position where if all goes well, it takes us a couple of weeks to clone our plasmid of interest just a day to transform the bacteria, a month or two to select them. So we can generate hundreds of mutants in parallel using this pipeline within just a few months. So where are we now? We have targeted about 500 proteins using this approach so far. And of those, we've managed to generate about 90% of the plasmid that we intended to. We've also got a really good conversion rate from those plasmids into making marked mutants. And I was surprised that the efficiency was this high because I thought that there might be a lot of deleterious effects of C terminally tagging essential proteins, for instance. We also have quite a high rate of conversion between marked mutant and markless mutants. And I do expect this conversion rate to rise a bit having optimized this protocol a little bit more recently. And now in the process of imaging all of our markless mutants and the marked mutants, for which we don't have markless counterparts. And all in all, we've got imaging data for significantly more than 10% of this particular cyanobacterial proteome at this point in time. So this imaging data, I'd just like to share with you some of what that looks like and some of the insights that we have already gained from tagging just this fraction of the cyanobacterial proteome. 
Here are a few example images. The one on the left shows a tagged photosystem 2 protein, which is localizing what we think should localize to the thylakoid membranes. And we can see that the green signal roughly coincides with the magenta signal arising from the autofluorescent of pigments in the thylakoid membrane. In the middle, we tag the transcription factor in the green there, and we can see that it localizes towards the center of the cell where we would expect to find the genetic material. On the right, this is perhaps the most striking localization pattern that we see, which is what happens when we tag known carboxazone proteins. They form the point tie along the central axis of the cell. By far the most common localization we see, though, is exemplified in this bottom corner, where we see a lot of proteins forming quite a diffuse localization pattern within the cytoplasm. Interestingly, we see some surprising localizations for known proteins, such as this one, which I thought might be diffusely localized. It seems to be forming these discrete point tie in the cytoplasm and possibly outside it. And we also have a group of proteins whose function was previously unknown, but have some quite interesting and striking localization things. So we're potentially using this pipeline to gain some novel insights into protein function. I'll just share a few examples of those now. So I haven't studied these in any great depth with this being a sort of high soup approach, but there are some interesting clues to protein function, which I think are really exciting. So this is possibly my favorite example of an interestingly localized protein. It's the only protein that localized like this of the 300 that I've imaged. We see some signal in the cell body, but we see an enrichment of signals around the membrane and much stronger enrichment of signals capping the ends of the cell. So forming these little caps at the cell poles. So it might not be unique in its localization, but nothing has been published about this protein specifically in the past. So I would be fascinated to find out what happens when we knock it out and other such details about this hypothetical protein. We also have a couple of examples of proteins that appear to localize to sites where we think cell wall biogenesis may be happening and ultimately cell division. So on the left, we can see a protein which appears to be localizing to these points, either at the brightest at points where cells are separating. And you can see fainter signals at cell poles of recently divided cells or in the central part of a longer cell, which looks like it's starting to divide. And our collaborator, Goyan in China, has actually knocked out this protein and found out that there is a slight defect in the cell's ability to divide. So we might have gone from tagging a protein to actually understanding partially its function in a relatively short amount of time. On the right here, there's a protein which has similar localization, but is not so specifically localized to these positions in the cell. It's got quite a diffuse localization. And then we see these brighter spots at those regions where cell wall might be being made or cell division might be controlled. We have to do some further work to find out in more detail. So now we've tagged 10 to 15% of the proteome in this model cyanobacteria. We're now in a position to expand the cyanosog pipeline to cover the whole protein with the ultimate aim of understanding that protein and the interactions between the proteins in it in more depth. One of the reasons that I was quite enthusiastic to come and talk at these seminars and at the conference in a couple of weeks is to get an idea of the genes and pathways the researchers in the field are really interested in. We might already have some imaging or interaction data about those genes, or we might be able to prioritize those genes in the tagging pipeline going forward. I'd also love to talk to people with expertise in managing large data sets and storing large libraries of cells to make sure that we're working with the best practice and we're not falling into any traps. And also keen to speak to people who might have complementary data sets, which could be combined in a powerful way to maximize the value of these resources for the wider research community. I'm also very keen to look at the wider context in which our work operates and always enthusiastic conversations about what the role of science and scientists are in the context of our climate and ecological emergencies that are unfolding before our eyes at the moment. So with that, I would like to thank everyone who's attended the talk for your attention and particularly to the organizers for the invitation and to everyone in Europe and in China who has contributed to this work. Very happy to answer questions now or outside the meeting and you can always get in touch by email or on social media.